So very tough act to follow after that performance by Dr. Uh, Moreno. I have uh, some really good news for you, though. It's the last talk. You get to go home, and I have no questions. <laughs> so you don't. You can go to sleep, but. Actually, I would suggest that you don't because as nurses and technologists and healthcare providers, it is you who helps us avoid this very, very important complication of acute kidney injury. And I wanna share with you some of the very important reasons why we need you because the doctors are paying very little attention to this. And it's been a really a long, uh, I would say last 15 years of my career trying to put this important complication on the map. And I think we've made huge progress that could never have happened without our nurses, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, and all of you in the audience who really help the physicians follow the patients and look for this important complication, but especially before the procedure. And I always put this particular slide up because everyone thinks that we could measure renal function by just looking at the serum creatinine. But the fact of the matter is that that's the worst way because the serum creatinine is very much dependent on your age, your muscle mass, your body surface area. And unless you use an estimated GFR to actually calculate the glomerular filtration rate, you won't know whether or not the patient has chronic kidney disease. And a great example of this is a little old lady who has a creatinine of 1.1 versus a, a, a muscular 45-year-old man who also has a creatinine of 1.1, and the guy probably his uh, creatinine clearance would be 75 cc's per minute and the ladies could be uh, as low as 30 cc's per minute even with a creatinine of 1.1. So really importantly use these formulae. These are the two. There's a third one called EP, the EPI form formula that basically estimates the glomerular filtration rate in milliliters per minute and in, in this particular MDRD equation it figures it out in milliliters per minute per 1.73 meters per, per meter squared versus millimeters per minute here in the um, krakow galt equation. How do we look at contrast-induced nephropathy? It really is, has to be the only way we're going to find it is if we look for it, and that's a nuanced exacerbation of renal function in absence of other causes, obviously, after contrast media injection. And that's usually by either an increase of 25% or an absolute increase of 0.5 milliliters per deciliter. But now they're even using, they're getting closer now to 0.3 milliliters per minute increase. Could be acute kidney injury, stage one acute kidney injury. So very important to measure that creatinine. And it's important to know the time course of it because the time course is not just immediately after the procedure. And especially in our ambulatory procedures, we, you know, a lot of these patients go home and those at risk really do need to be followed because the peak is between 24 to 48 hours after procedure. So if the post creatinine is going up, we have to bring those patients back because it's a very, very important complication. Can we prevent this complication? I think we can, but maybe what we can do the first and foremost is to assess the patient's risk status before the procedure. Because that's so very important uh, first to also, not only can you guys help us, is to basically identify these risks and alert us that this is a really high risk patient and it's not just about their baseline renal function, but all these important risk assessments. And the risk assessment of CIN is, is very, very important because it could identify those patients at risk for contrast-induced acute kidney injury. And some of those risks you can't do anything about. Those are non-modifiable risk factors such as pre-existing renal failure, diabetes, older age, there's nothing we can do about those things. Advanced heart failure, reduced ejection fraction, patients presenting with an acute myocardial infarction or in cardiogenic shock. These are patients at high risk. We know we've got to be very careful about their kidneys because you could fix the heart and the patient ends up on dialysis and their death rate will be five to ten times higher than a patient whose kidney was protected and, and CIN 
and was prevented. So that's how important it is. And while we're all so focused on our complex procedures, which you will see in the next few days, it's really, really important to pay attention uh, to the kidneys. What are those modifiable risk factors that we as clinicians and healthcare providers can do something about? And those are hemodynamic instability. So really important to, to think about that. The volume of contrast media, extremely important. Someone who's dehydrated and whose volume status is below norm, and you can really understand that by just putting a catheter into the LV, and if the LV end diastolic pressure is two in this little old lady whose baseline creatinine is 1.1, you really have to think, wow, this patient is going to be at a high risk. Can we hydrate this patient? Can we give some fluids even on the table before we inject dye in her? Importantly, things like nephrotoxic drugs and diuretics have to be also talked about. And why is it so important? Take a look at what happens when you add diabetes and, and a bad renal function on top of each other and the curve goes up like like uh, you know uh, like a rocket going up and you can see this here how important it is that as you decrease the creatinine clearance the event rates increase tremendously especially if you have diabetes and those are the people in red compared to the non-diabetic patients so having diabetes and chronic kidney disease the need for dialysis the need for co uh, the, the contrast induced acute kidney injury goes up tremendously and very important is the contact, con, the volume in these patients with diabetes. So whatever we could do to, to really limit that volume is going to be extremely, really important. And not just in the diabetic patients, but also in those patients with chronic kidney disease. If you increase the contrast volume in patients with chronic kidney disease, you really do increase in a linear fashion their risk of acute kidney injury. And if you look at the relative, absolute and relative contrast volume, extremely important. You can see how important it is that estimated GFR and the volume of contrast media, those two are really together in this 3D model showing you how important it is to really, really be very, very careful in patients with chronic kidney disease and diabetes. There are many, many risk calculators, and I'm, I'm proud to say that one of the first ones developed was by myself. It's called the Moran Risk Score for Contrast-Induced Acute Kidney Injury. It's right here. It's very, very simple, and you can get it online. Everyone's all over it. It's on so many apps now. People are using it, and it's you get an integer score for each of these risk factors, hypotension, balloon pump, heart failure, age greater than 75, anemia, diabetes, and then for every 100 cc's of contrast, volume, you get another integer score. And for the serum creatinine and estimated GFR, you have different numbers. You put those in, the risk score comes out, and you could tell the patient what their risk, and you could tell even the doc what the risk of contrast-induced acute kidney injury or even dialysis is in a very, very good way. And once we develop this, there are others who've come up with other risk factors, and, and very important, this is the most recent um, 2013 in Jack, where they looked at this uh, particular risk calculator called the BMC squared or BMC2 risk calculator, and there was also very, very good risk score, and it had a very, very nice, uh, what you see this line, it basically shows shows that the C statistic was very, very good. In other words, it was reliably predicting both in the in both models where they found the risk factor and validated it. It was very good. And you could see there are some differences between our risk score and the one that was developed by the, the group, the Grum group. And theirs is if the patient, what's the patient's presentation? What's the indication for PCI? The clinical history is their diabetes or the patient is on diabetic therapy. The characteristics of age, weight, and height. And then importantly, the pre-procedural labs, including CKMB, serum creatinine, hemoglobin, and troponin. So very similar, but in some ways different. And it's important, like in a STEMI patient, you're not going to know all these pre-procedural labs because they're coming in. This particular 
one really just looks at the patient's risk profile as you seeing them. So they're both pretty good risk models and you can get each and every one of them. The one we did is only about 8,500 patients. The other one has over 68,000 patients. So you could see the C statistics seem more reliable here. It's now in the um, risk calculators of the um, NCDR and the ACC registries. So it is really, really important that at the very least, we use these risk calculators to assess the patient's risk. And here are where you could find these online. What else can we do? The most important thing that has shown time and time again that there is a very important effect on reducing and preventing acute kidney injury, something we're really bad at, not here at Mount Sinai, but in the world, is hydrating the patients. And hydration as tolerated is really for as long as possible, as, as much as we can before the hospital administrators tell us to get, get the patient out of the door, is probably the most important important measure in preventing contrast-induced acute kidney injury, especially if that patient isn't going to get their procedure until 9 p.m. And, and we're very, very careful here at Mount Sinai looking at those important parameters, keeping the oral hydration and the IV hydration up in those patients, especially when they have uh, their procedure. And what's the optimal hydration? You can give normal saline when you can because it's better compared to half normal saline in this 1,700 patient study. It was better in reducing contrast-induced acute kidney injury. What about sodium bicarbonate? Everyone is talking about if we give bicarb, we could save it. And there have been so many different studies. I can tell you it doesn't work. And the, meta, the most recent meta-analysis shows that it really doesn't work. But there is this particular um, device. I call it the, um, the portable nurse that is making sure that there is a maintenance of a high urine output in the patient by continuously giving hydration and actually giving Lasix to follow that up to keep keep this very high urine output of 150 cc's per minute. Um, and it's right now being studied in a large prospective study because this early study in Italy, 157 patients, there was a major reduction in contrast-induced acute kidney injury with this versus a normal hydration. A second study with a larger number of patients, 300 patients, they showed an important effect. And so as a result, we are doing a pivotal U.S. study and Mount Sinai is the number one enroller in this trial. And I'm proud to lead this trial trial nationally for basically understanding if we keep a high urine output, can we reduce the contrast-induced acute kidney injury? What about the volume of contrast media? I already told you how important it was. It's in the calculator that I developed. And there's no question that if we could, we should be able to modulate and understand how much volume we're giving. And it really, and, and the physicians are so into their procedures, sometimes they forget how much volume they're giving. So there's a lot of very interesting new gadgets. And this particular gadget, and we're going to be a part of this study, is actually a contrast modulator that gets connected to the um, manifold uh, and you're able to actually, and you take a look at this and if you could see it, this is with the modulator off and with the modulator on and each time what it's doing, it's measuring how much of the blood is going in forward and as soon as the coronary is filled, it doesn't let you inject. The rest of the injection that the doctor pushed goes into a reservoir instead of into the patient. And about a third of the contrast media is saved in this, in this particular procedure. And they did a 21-patient uh, study where there was a very important reduction in the volume of contrast media. And as such, we're doing a 600-patient study. I, I'm honored again to lead this particular trial. We're bringing it to Mount Sinai to see if we could actually use this gadget, reduce the volume, and can we then reduce contrast-induced acute kidney injury. What about the type of contrast media? Well, first and foremost, we know that 
high osmolar, high PEG, it's already out of every cath lab, so we don't have to worry about it. But what about low versus iso-osmolar? This study, which Mount Sinai was a big enroller, Dr. Sharma was a co-author of this, of this trial, uh, published in circulation in 2007, in all, close to 500 patients showed absolutely no benefit of iodixanol. And that's the reason why we here are not choosing low versus iso-osmolar contrast media in our patients. But the volume is really, really important. And so lastly, and most importantly, is not to be done with the patient at the end of the procedure, but to follow them through their post-procedural course. And that's what we rely on you to do, and that's really repeating the serum creatinine, measuring the estimated GFR, and continuing hydration, especially in those high-risk patients with all those risk factors, for at least 12 hours. So to conclude, and um, this is it, two more slides, contrast-induced acute kidney injury is a frequent source of acute renal failure, a very, very important complication associated with higher mortality, morbidity, longer ward stay, of course, need for dialysis, resource utilization, which we're really, really paying a lot of attention to, the quality metrics and 30-day readmissions are very, very important. These are the patients, if we don't watch out for them, they'll come back in our 30-day readmission PCI can go up higher if we don't pay attention to this important complication. There are important factors that predispose patients. You should know those risks. Prevent, uh, make sure we understand what that patient's risk is before the procedure. And then the preventive measures start before the procedure in assessing the patient's risk, hydrating the patient, getting them through the procedure, and then following them after the procedure. And what we do is hydration, stopping their nephrotoxic agents. There's no role for pretty much anything else at the moment. So N-acetylcysteine doesn't work. Bicarb doesn't work. All of these have been tried over and over again in multiple, multiple studies. The sodium bicarb doesn't work. So we're basically down to this. Limit the contrast volume, hydrate the patients, enroll them in these studies that we're doing right now, use lower osmolar agents, and very, very important, very, very important is to follow that patient after the procedure and make sure that we know what their serum creatinine is and what it's doing in its downhill hopefully going down or remaining stable. And with that, if you can prevent this important complication, we can make a huge impact on our PCI patient population in, in reducing morbidity, mortality, and improving the quality of life in these patients. Thank you so much for your attention.